So we're going to get, we're going to start. So thank you everyone and welcome to our inaugural clinical informatics grand round at the Department of Medical Informatics and Clinical Epidemiology at OHSU. Try saying that three times quickly. Um, it gives me great pleasure to actually introduce this series because it represents an evolutionary step in the growth of DMICE as a department. Uh, we have grown uh, and added to our training program so that we not only have certificates, masters, uh, PhD, pre and post doctoral uh, programs, but also now starting this year, a ACGME certified clinical informatics subspecialty program. And our, our first cohort of two fellows, Inho and Jim, are here amongst us. Um, uh, we are one of uh, a handful of programs offering subspecialty certification in clinical informatics. Um, and as we've grown by adding uh, to our educational component uh, exponentially, we've also grown in adding to the kind of learning opportunities that are available to folks at DMICE. And in addition to our regular didactic components, our, our extremely large course catalog, the Thursday research conferences that we have, um, I'm very pleased to report that we are also adding a monthly series of uh, clinical informatics specific grand rounds that are patterned on the ACGME medical grand rounds of clinical specialties. Um, and therefore, similar to uh, other medical grand rounds at OHSU, we've applied for and successfully received permission to offer CME credits up to one hour of uh, AMA PRA category one CME credit for physicians who would like to take um, avail of this opportunity for each of these grand round offerings. Um, and so I'd like to thank uh, some folks at CME, Michelle Favreau, our associate dean uh, for professional development and lifelong learning, um, Leslie Doring, Alex Cartgrave at CME, who were instrumental in getting our proposal through. And of course, here at DMICE, uh, Andrea Ill. Uh, and Lynn Schwabi, who have been kind of instrumental in making sure that the administrative component of this, um, uh, of this grand round series uh, has come to fruition. Uh, and so if anyone who is here or listening online is interested in obtaining CME credit, uh, uh, if you're here, then Lynn has some paperwork for you. And if you're online, if you email her at schwabel at ohsu.edu, uh, she can set you up for the process of CME. And if any of you are online and have questions during Bill's presentation, um, you can always uh, uh, tweet to us uh, at, at OHSU Informatics, and that hashtag is hashtag DMICONF. So now with the housekeeping out of the way, it is my pleasure to introduce our inaugural speaker uh, for this series of Clinical Informatics Grand Round. Uh, I didn't have to travel far. I just got out of my office, went up the stairs, knocked on his door. It's William Hirsch, who is our chair. Uh, most of you know him. I'm going to very, very briefly introduce him. Uh, he trained in medicine at the University of Illinois in Chicago, stayed in Chicago for his internal medicine residency at the University of Illinois Hospital, and then went to Boston for formal medical informatics fellowship at Harvard. And then in 1990, he came to OHSU. And it's really interesting to see how there's such a parallel between the growth of DMICE and informatics at OHSU and the growth of uh, informatics as a discipline in the United States and uh, the great experiment that has come out of all of this. So no one is in a better position to talk to us about this great experiment than Bill, who's been at the center of it for so many years. So without further ado, thanks, Vishnu. And, uh, I too want to welcome everyone um, to Clinical Informatics Grand Round Test. Those of you who have been around know, and I'm glad the camera can't capture the fact that no one wants to sit <laughs> near me here. But anyways, um, um, uh, as you know, I've uh, historically um, kind of given the first talk in our conference series uh, each year, and um, decided to do that again this year. Um, and, um, and then also we're, um, as Vishnu mentioned, launching our Clinical Informatics Grand Rounds, which is one of the things that you do uh, when you become a medical uh, specialty or subspecialty. Um, but reflecting the fact that the, the, our Clinical Informatics Fellowship is really part of our larger program, and I've always 
always wanted it to be that way. Um, it's very important for it to be that way. Um, we decided to insert it in this conference series, much in the way that we insert um, the uh, informatics discovery lab talks um, on a periodic basis um, in this as well. So um, uh, once a month or so, we will be doing uh, clinical informatics grand rounds. We're also going to be um, offering uh, continuing medical education or CME credit for physicians, uh, particularly those who are among the uh, 787 board certified uh, clinical informaticians now who will be needing to keep up in their field. Um, so so for the, uh, oftentimes I've kind of just sort of given an overview of the field um, but, and the program, but this year I thought to um, take a look back, um, and in particular I actually went back and, as you'll see on some of my slides, pulled out some of my own writings um, or, and, and own, own, my own statements uh, and using that to kind of look back at, we're, we're really at this turning point now where um, essentially the high-tech era is drawing to a close and um, what lies ahead uh, for informatics. I, I, I hope I'll convince you that it's a pretty optimistic picture, although there's obviously some um, problems that we need to overcome. <clears throat> These slides, uh, as always, um, there's a PDF uh, including all the references on my website uh, right here at the top. Uh, or if people want to email me, I'll send them to them as well. Uh, for those of you out in cyberspace, we will be uh, watching the Twitter feed. I know someone up there is watching it, but uh, I will watch it too, as I usually do in the conferences, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that come in that way. I've actually tried to keep the talk a little on the shorter side um, to, to leave time for questions, although we um, are, are off to a slightly late start due to the different location today. Um, but anyways, um, when you join the continuing medica medical education world, they have to do things like disclosures. So I have to disclose that I have no stocks or anything like that. Um, although, as I always point out, I teach informatics for a living, um, so maybe that's a conflict of interest, but uh, hopefully not. Um, OHSU is accredited by the um, ACCME uh, to provide CME credit um, and is available to... Um, uh, physicians who wish to obtain it. <clears throat> in um, uh, CME type talks, one must provide learning objectives uh, explicitly. And so here is uh, what you all saw in the email that uh, Lynn sent around, um, just talking about the $30 billion investment in high tech, um, the grand experiment, as I called it, in 2010. Um, and here we are uh, five, six years later with the results in. So we'll describe the rationale for the investment, present the beneficial and problematic results, and then discuss um, moving forward. So I'm actually going to present my talk <clears throat> like the way that we uh, tell all the trainees to write scientific papers uh, with an introduction. Uh, in the introduction, I'll talk about some of the problems and solutions that uh, we talked about for the electronic health record, um, the methods of this study were the implementation of the High Tech Act. Uh, I'll show you uh, some of the results and um, then uh, wrap it up with some discussion on moving forward. So um, a decade ago, um, we knew that there were a lot of problems in healthcare that informatics could contribute towards solving. The um, IOM report, it seems like ages ago, but back around 2000 came out, um, the so-called errors report that documented uh, anywhere from 48 to 96,000 uh, deaths per year due to medical errors. Some people arguing it's too low, some arguing it's too high, um, but no one arguing that there were safety problems in healthcare and medicine. Um, the famous McGlynn study in 2003 showing that patients only got about 55% of the care um, that uh, they should be getting if they were treated by best practices uh, known at the time. Um, the cost issues, both the cost of, of health care but also the cost of electronic health records, uh, studies in the early to mid-2000s, one noting that um, there um, at that time was a clear cost, um, cost uh, return on investment for electronic health records, but that the the return didn't go to the people who made the investment. 
um, which is part of the motivation for the High Tech Act. The uh, physician practices making the investments and the insurance companies and the laboratories actually getting the financial benefit. Um, and then also another modeling study, modeling studies always have limitations, but um, showing or, or showing at least in this model that widespread interoperability of electronic health records could save the healthcare system uh, around $77 billion per year, that study coming from the RAND Corporation. We also knew uh, <clears throat> at the time that physicians had challenges accessing information. A study coming out of Iowa finding that 44% um, of ambulatory visits resulting in a piece of information not being obtainable by the physician. And um, so these were some of the rationales for um, uh, investing in electronic health records. So what was the solution? Interoperable healthcare records. Uh, some of you remember 10 years ago uh, when I had the uh, opportunity to be on NPR and on Ira Flato's Talk to the Nation, and uh, along with uh, the esteemed Dr. Lucian Leap and, and uh, Dr. Joe Heyman, and um, <clears throat> we talked about the state of the art at the time. None of us could really uh, foresee high tech at the time, the government was investing millions and not billions, um, and um, we all recognized that somehow that if we wanted to achieve the benefits, that investment needed to be higher. Um, other benefits for electronic health records are the so-called secondary use, the, the seminal AMIA white paper on uh, the value of secondary use or reuse of data in electronic health records, um, and then implementing the learning health system, a concept put forth by the Institute of Medicine that we need to do a much better job in medicine of learning from what we do, pointing to examples in the uh, airline industry, the nuclear power industry, and so forth. Um, so this is what I said on that show. Um, you can actually still go listen to the MP3 or download the transcript. What we have now is, the most, is that most transactions in healthcare take place on paper, not true anymore, but it was at the time, whether it's fax or slips of paper, and this leads to medical errors, duplication, and so forth. What we're advocating is replacing the traditional paper chart and all of its problems with an electronic one. It will now not solve all the problems in medicine, but will go a long way towards solving some. So we were very optimistic in 2005. Um, actually, a year earlier, I had the opportunity to write a, uh, an editorial in JAMA, the famous journal, and some of you have seen this slide before, uh, looking at the reasons why we had not achieved the better adoption of, of all kinds of health information technology, um, the cost, again, not so much the cost of investment, but the mismatch between who pays and who benefits. Some of the technical challenges, not so much really technology problems, but things like usability, interoperability, things like that, um, interoperability being one. Um, I made mention of privacy and confidentiality, not really knowing how big this issue was going to be, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and then, because of my uh, interest in educating people, um, I raised the issue that we don't have the workforce uh, to uh, potentially um, uh, benefit, um, uh, to take advantage of the technology that's available. Um, then 2009 came, we had a new president, the economy was tanking, and um, we needed an economic stimulus, and uh, certainly um, something that was kind of shovel-ready uh, for uh, economic stimulus would be to invest in electronic health records. And um, uh, as he said right before uh, inauguration, to improve the quality of our health care while lowering costs, we'll make the investments needed to ensure that within five years, that was last year. Um, all of America's medical records are computerized. It just won't save billions of dollars and thousands of jobs. And the thought saving thousands of jobs I thought was important. It will save lives by reducing deadly and preventable medical errors that pervade our healthcare system. This led to the Health Information for Technology, Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health, or High Tech Act, which mainly consists of uh, incentives for adoption of electronic health records. Um, at the time, they said up to $27 billion, but we've actually exceeded that. And then um, a number of grants uh, from federal agencies for workforce development, regional extension centers, um, and so forth. And um, 
uh, about $2 billion total, including $118 million for workforce, which was, uh, I don't know if anyone in the room was a beneficiary of that, uh, but uh, our department certainly was, and um, I, I think we made really great contributions with the investment that the government made in us. And when high tech was born, um, uh, I proclaimed in my blog, which some of you read, um, that informatics now lives in a high tech world. In fact, a few years ago when I gave this uh, introductory talk, uh, that's what I said. Um, and I talked about the, or that was the title of the talk. Uh, the flurry of activity um, laid out uh, is um, uh, immense. And I also said this. This is a defining moment for the informatics field. So this is in uh, early 2010. Never before has such money and attention been lavished on it. High tech provides a clear challenge to the field to get it right. Did we? We'll talk about that. It will be interesting to look back on this time in the years ahead, that's now, and see what worked and did not work. Whatever does happen, it's clear that informatics now lives in a high tech world. So what did high tech actually do? I think probably most of you know, but for the few that might not, um, provided incentives for the so-called meaningful use of electronic health records. This required eligible hospitals and eligible professionals to meet various criteria in certain stages, stages one, two, and three, <clears throat> using um, EHR technology that had been certified by a process specified by the government um, adhering to certain standards um, that, in retrospect, were probably uh, not, didn't go far enough, um, and have the ability to measure and send quality measures as well as enable health information exchange, the movement of data across business boundaries in healthcare. And if you look at this slide, you can make the case that high tech was extraordinarily successful, whether it's, I don't think, do I have a, whether it's um, uh, physicians in their offices from 2009 to now with uh, any EHR or having some basic set of functions, uh, emergency departments, outpatient departments, and probably the biggest success of all um, is in hospitals. So nearly every hospital in the United States at this point has a certified electronic health record system. They haven't all achieved all the meaningful use criteria, but from that standpoint, um, meaningful use has been successful. And I could just kind of end my talk here and, and go on to celebrate, but um, there have been some problems. And I'll, I'll go through these in the next few slides. Um, uh, interoperability hasn't quite worked as well as people hoped. Um, there's been a particularly adverse impact on workflow. Um, we have this kind of conundrum around um, structured versus unstructured data, usability problems, problems with safety of health IT. We, have, we touted, as I did back in 2005 on NPR, that, that we would improve safety in healthcare, which we probably have, but we've also introduced new challenges, and then security issues, which I alluded to in a moment. Um, <clears throat> So what's, what's happened with interoperability? The, um, how could we possibly have installed electronic health records in every hospital in the country, yet they cannot easily talk to each other? Um, th there are some exceptions, uh, actually a number of exceptions, but um, there's no kind of universal communication. Um, we, um, there's a number of reasons for this. One is the um, incomplete adoption of standards and the um, uh, JSON report uh, was put out uh, for ONC that criticized um, the lack of, of some of the modern API-based approaches that we use to send information around the internet. It's actually led ONC to uh, establish uh, the JSON task force to respond to its recommendations, and, and there's been some good to come out of that. Um, a more recent uh, well, something that's been around a while, but documented more recently is this notion of information blocking. Um, not, um, it's not so much a, a technical issue as it is a, um, a business issue in that uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, healthcare systems do not, healthcare systems sometimes block sending information to each other. Sometimes it's due to the cost that it would take to implement the ability to exchange information. 
So that's one problem. Um, I, um, I was joking, actually I was in a, a seminar for our fellows uh, earlier this morning and they put up this slide and I was joking that you can't give an informatics talk these days without showing this picture. Um, this uh, picture uh, was published in JAMA, the famous journal, um, and it was drawn by a nine-year-old who was um, seeing her physician with her family and it's very telling that she's sitting on the exam table and interacting with uh, presumably, I don't know, her sister, her mother, her baby sister, and there's all these houses out in the community. And what's the doctor doing over here? Punched over the computer. Um, this is clearly a problem. Um, there's other problems as well. Uh, there's concerns that there is um, too much focus on the computer rather than the patient. There's a, a paper uh, published earlier this year called Writing the Wrong um, that talks about that. Um, there's a, a famous um, uh, radiologist. His, um, he and his father um, is also a radiologist and accused him of leading to the demise of radiology rounds. When I was a medical student, a resident, uh, one of the stops during our day, at least once a day, was to the radiology department, and you'd sit around with the radiologist and review your films. Well, we don't need to do that anymore. Just like, I guess, in a sense, we don't need for the number of people who didn't show up here today. Maybe they're watching at their desks. Um, the, uh, uh, the senior, Dr. Chang, uh, felt that his son had led to really the demise of reviewing films and, and some of the nuances and things like that, because now you just get the report, you get the, the image itself on your workstation, on your ward, you don't have to go down to the radiology department. And this facilitates workarounds, um, like the copy and paste problem, which uh, maybe someone has called sloppy and paste, where people copy and paste electronic text and sometimes propagating things that are wrong. Um, this was actually a phenomenon uh, first documented by one of our former trainees, Dr. Peter Enby, who did this fellowship about 10 years ago. He's now um, uh, vice chair in the informatics department at Ohio State. Um, and this problem has um, come to be known and there's lots of concerns about it, although some argue um, that historically that's what we've done. We've looked at yesterday's notes and if things look the same, that's what we write. Um, there, there might be a role for propagating information, but not just in a kind of blind copy and paste sort of way. Um, there's uh, huge concerns about usability of electronic health records. Um, there's a, 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 this uh, study from the uh, a group called American EHR noting that um, satisfaction of um, uh, EHRs uh, seems to be uh, on the decline. Um, from previous years when people weren't uh, given meaningful use incentive dollars to adopt them. Um, part of this is due, I think, to a problem with medical data and, and something that I don't think we can blame on the vendors or the government or anyone else, but uh, something I've been concerned about. I have a great um, excitement about structured data that's in the electronic health record and all the secondary uses, which I mentioned in a previous slide, we can do with it. Um, the problem is um, physicians don't like um, structured data. They, if they're entering the data, they want to tell the story. If they're reading the data, they want to read the story. And I've had many physicians, that's why I say personal communications here. I don't have an actual reference for this, although I'm sure I could easily find something. Um, but many physicians, you know, when I tell them what I do, you know, they start complaining at me. And one of the big things is, you know, I don't trust medical records anymore. They're um, especially medical records that are check boxes and things like that. Um, I want to know the story. Um, this one uh, writer um, uh, a few years ago saying, um, patients don't speak template. Patients come in with a story. There's lots of nuances. And so I think this is one area that I think we just underestimated how difficult it was going to be. Just a conundrum. That's what I can't think of a better word to describe it uh, between structured and unstructured data. And something that we're going to have to figure out going forward. Will natural language processing play a role? Maybe. Um, but, um, but even this issue aside, there are still usability problems. And there was a study published just a few weeks ago in JAMA that um, talked about um, vendors not adhering to rules that they're supposed to adhere to 
about usability testing and so forth in their products. Um, I, I think that vendors could be doing a better job on usability. I also think that electronic health records are a very complicated uh, piece of software. And um, as much as you know, we love our phones and um, easy to use applications, that medical records are complicated and I think we're gonna have to deal with that. Um, uh, another kind of thing relating to usability is this report that was um, done by the RAND Corporation for the AMA um, looking at um, things that cause physician dissatisfaction with their jobs. And you'll never guess, this is 2013, what ranked number one, electronic health records, although they did point out physicians approve of EHRs in concept, um, but um, that the, felt that the current state of EHR technology um, uh, is worse. And so um, uh, these are issues that, that we have to figure out how to deal with. Um, there's also these safety issues. I, I don't think anyone really anticipated this. The Joint Commission, which accredits hospitals and healthcare organizations, has these sentinel alerts that are things that are really important safety issues that hospitals should watch out for. Two of these alerts in the past decade have been around um, health IT safety. Um, the Institute of Medicine uh, published a report on um, health IT safety and, and what we need to do about it. Um, that report has a chapter from a few OHSU authors led by Joan Ash on um, how do we, uh, what kind of roadmap do we follow to avoid what we call EI atrogenesis. And then there are some well-known recent mishaps. Um, uh, some of you may be familiar with the book by Bob Wachter, which is a very nice read um, and, and ends, despite its kind of negative tone initially, ends in a very positive way, but spends a fair amount of time talking about a patient at UCSF who got a common antibiotic, a trimethoprim sulfa, some of you know what that is, at 38 times the dose. You know, how could that possibly happen with such a common medication that we use for urinary tract infections? Um, and then we all know the story of the uh, Ebola patient in Dallas who, um, because of miscommunication, was discharged home, um, probably exposed people at least to the virus, um, and a report was recently published on that, on, on, on some of the issues there. Um, and then there is this security issue. I love this slide. It was just in the New, York, New Yorker. Your previous provider refused to share your electronic medical records, but not to worry, I was able to obtain all your information online. Um, and the reason why I say two for one is it highlights two problems that we have. One is the health exchange, health information exchange and interoperability problem that I already alluded to. The other problem is the fact that we can find people's information online, which is a problem. And this year especially has been the year of the mega breach. Um, it started, uh, I think, in January. Uh, Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield had 80 million records compromised. Um, Premier Blue Cross, um, 11 million records. Excellus Blue Cross, 10 million records. And there have been many, many more. A report just came out from KPMG um, finding that 81% of health IT leaders reported that their systems were compromised in the last 24 months. So this is another issue that uh, we absolutely have to solve, although it's hardly unique to medicine. Um, maybe some of you are following the uh, Office of Personnel Management for the federal government, um, which started as it thought this might be a one million uh, person breach, and now it's up to five million people, and there's things like fingerprints and all that in the database. Um, so there are huge privacy and security issues, and since the most private and confidential information is in medical records, something that um, we need to uh, address. So I gave you that initial graph going up. We were successful. Then I told you all this horrendous stuff. Is this like total despair? I'll say no, because I'm an optimist, and I tend to think that the glass is half full. And so... Um, uh, we have to remember that there's still research that shows the benefit of health IT, that there are emerging models for more effective use of it. Um, there are various calls to improve usability and interoperability, and there's a lot of opportunity to really do good things with electronic health records, especially in areas of data science and data analytics. So um, there's plenty of evidence 
that electronic health records are uh, provide value to the delivery of health care and to patients. This was a systematic review published last year that was organized around the meaningful use criteria. So there's actually evidence to support those. So functionality like clinical decision support, um, uh, health information exchange, e-prescribing, et cetera. Um, when you, even though the clinical epi folks in our department might not like the way this is done because you're not really supposed to count studies, but if you do count studies, um, most of them are either positive or mixed positive. So um, there is value, um, at least when health IT is done right. Um, there's also people who have given a lot of thought to using the computer in the exam room. Um, this is a paper that I, I found um, when researching this talk uh, about ways to think about engaging the patient when they come in for their visit to not uh, be like that nine-year-old Drew facing the other way and um, uh, while the patient's playing with their parents and baby sister, um, things like greeting the patient, setting things up so the patient's made clear to the patient that the computer is there in the room, um, trying to avoid interrupting them to turn to the computer, um, engage, engaging them with the screen. Oftentimes it usually means turning the screen around so the patient can see what you're entering, um, uh, interacting with them as you do it, and, and really educating them um, kind of along the process. So um, uh, minimizing screen gaze and, and uh, trying to stick with the patient and, of course, expressing um, empathy as clinicians should be doing. So th there, I think there's, there's hope in this direction. Um, there are, I'll go through a few um, important documents that, that I think point a path forward. Um, or we could be like, um, some of you know John Halanka and, and Bob Wachter, who wrote The Digital Doctor, who basically say, you know, it's kind of like Vietnam. Let's just declare victory and go home. Um, say, we did great meaningful use, and now let's move on. Um, but I think there are some, uh, th some of these uh, documents are worth taking a look at. So the um, AMA published a paper, um, and these are all referenced in, in my PDF, uh, of um, improving electronic health record usability, um, uh, re really focusing on the physicians and their participation in the healthcare team, coordinating care, to um, focus electronic health records that way. Um, also, though, talking about promoting data liquidity, making it easy for data to um, appropriately move from place to place and, and also be reused. Um, another one uh, came from AMIA. This was uh, released um, a few months ago. Um, uh, their AMIA had set up a uh, task force to look at the status and future directions and things like, I apologize for the typo there, improve documentation requirements and functionality to empower patients, refocus regulations, i.e. meaningful use, um, so that patients and their caregivers can get the most benefit, increasing transparency in how uh, EHR vendors operate, for example, uh, fostering innovation and supporting person-centered care. Um, another uh, physician paper comes from the American College of Physicians. You may recognize our own Tom Yackel as one of the authors here. Um, I, I won't read through all these, but, but basically talking about the importance of clinical documentation with the emphasis on the care of patients. And, as much as the secondary use and all that stuff we want to do, I think at the end of the day, it, it's most important for electronic health records to benefit patient care. Um, and, and then dealing with the um, uh, interoperability issue, uh, earlier this year, the ONC released its um, roadmap for interoperability. And um, it involves a number of things. We actually heard last week in our conference uh, from Keith Boone about uh, the Fast Health Interoperability Resources, or FIRE standard. That's a more modern way than the older HL7 ways of moving um, information, moving data back and forth. And actually, FIRE is now an official HL7 standard. Um, security, things like OAuth 2, 
um, which um, probably everyone in this room has used if you've ever signed up for a website um, where you used your Facebook or LinkedIn login. Um, there are modern ways to do security um, that can be enhanced in healthcare. Um, the um, ONC also is looking at, at various other standards, terminology standards, things like that. Um, and then pu pulling this all together is something called the Argonaut Project, which actually comes from the JSON report. Um, and um, developing um, uh, uh, an API and other uh, core data services based on FHIR. Um, yeah, or should we declare victory and go home? This is uh, Bob Wachter, and this is uh, John Holanka's blog. So I think there's opportunities. Um, so I'm going to try to finish off on a very positive note, and then uh, I, I've tried to leave plenty of time for the questions, both here and remotely. Um, so there are optimists that, that look at the way we have increased the amount of uh, data that's available. Um, John, Dr. Jonathan Perlin, who was at the VA for many years and now is with ACA, talks about the data dividend of um, um, uh, meaningful use. That, um, you know, we, uh, it's not, as I said in 2005, that everything's almost completely paper and fax based transactions. We, we still have plenty of that, unfortunately, but um, we've certainly made a lot of progress. Um, and the whole area of predictive analytics. Uh, there was a, a viewpoint published in JAMA not too long ago um, talking about how, if done right, predictive analytics could help physicians by helping them better understand what's going on in their communities, how patients are likely to respond to treatments, and so forth. Um, and the rationale still exists. Just this week, the Institute of Medicine came out with its... Um, uh, report on diagnostic errors and how serious they are. So we still can use better information delivered to the mind of the clinician as they're diagnosing and treating patients. There are still plenty of therapeutic errors as well. So um, the, those rationales for the EHR and, and health IT have not gone away. Um, and so informatics can be part of the solution. And then on the research side, um, we're undertaking um, this big precision medicine initiative um, that will, among other things, require uh, assembling a one million patient cohort. And uh, NIH came out with a report a few weeks ago looking at the things that were necessary to do that. And it's you know EHR, mobile devices, EHR, mobile devices. So. Uh, clearly, there's still great rationale for um, EHRs. And there's also um, growing need uh, for people who work in informatics, um, including uh, physicians in the new clinical informatics subspecialty, but physicians are not um, all there is about informatics. There's uh, plenty of roles for others. Um, and, of course, data scientists. Uh, and um, there's a uh, report I came across which verifies some data from a previous report that it's not only the hardcore data scientists we need, but there's this five to ten fold universe of people that are data users and managers that need to understand informatics, data science, and related topics to take advantage of this. So I think the picture is pretty bright. And so let me uh, conclude at that point by saying first, uh, Meaningful use, the grand experiment, has definitely been a mixed bag. Um, we uh, witnessed substantial adoption, as we saw by those graphs, but we also know that uh, systems are suboptimal, uh, could be better, in particular uh, issues of interoperability. So do we blame when I go to social events and people find out what I do and they start yelling at me. Um, I think we have some of the blame. Um, you know, we were very excited and enthusiastic, maybe a little naive, uh, back at the start of the high-tech era. Um, so how do we rectify that? Well, um, I think we need to step up and take the leadership and responsibility in, in solving some of the conundrums. And at this point, I'll stop and see what you think are some of the solutions or whether there's any questions. And as I understand it, in this room, this microphone will likely capture, uh, unlike our other normal room, uh, speak but speak loudly and then maybe I'll repeat the questions anyways. And then I'll also um, monitor the, I don't know, is anyone else monitoring the Twitter feed? I haven't seen anything. Okay. <coughs>
Well, good. So let me uh, thank you and let me open up uh, to any questions or comments. Dina. Um, so I have a couple of comments. One of them, um, and I've been working on the interoperability issue at the state for the last eight years, and a big uh, problem that we had um, with meaningful use is all the providers not included. Uh, early hearing detection intervention, audiologists, they're not included. Home visiting nurses, okay. they're not included. Uh, blah, 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 I could go on. Uh, and they have very important data, you know? So that's one thing that was, the non-eligible providers yes. were a big issue uh, for us. The other thing, uh, just went through uh, the process of um, health information exchange uh, project uh, between uh, OHR and CHR, uh, uh, newborn hearing screening, and using getting that data over in the uh, hearing plan of care of the CDA uh, over to uh, the state registry and consuming it over there. And uh, harmonization of the data elements was, and, and the value sets that go with those data elements was a huge undertaking. Uh, and even though going into it, uh, you know, which just you thought they were using the standards and all this kind of stuff, but it turns out, um, standard, yeah. there's standards and there's standards. Yes. And so we, we spent an enormous amount of work on that. So. Harmonization and standardization are yeah. huge issues to make all of this happen. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I, I mean, the first uh, point you mentioned about meaningful use was broad, but didn't include every last part of the um, uh, healthcare system. And especially as we enter the era of accountable care organizations where you need to coordinate all the information. Um, I don't know that meaningful use was ever really meant to. Um, you know, bring every last person on board, but um, clearly there needs to be ways. And, and hopefully, as we move towards the need for integrated and coordinated care, that, that that would just provide the incentive to bring the rest of those people along. But um, you're right. And, and then the issue of standards. Uh, standards are, are tough. Um, uh, you know, it's easy to kind of get up and say, you know, we, we need standards and there's so many of them out there, you know, why can't you use them? But um, um, that, you know, they're tough and, and they don't always work uh, like as you describe when, when people try to implement them. Um, you know, but we need to do that um, if we want to make uh, health care more interoperable and coordinated. I yeah. Oh. Yeah. I, I just have, this is about workflow. I yeah. Know, I'm curious. Um, Clinically, I was wondering if the hardware makes any difference in the, in the form of the hardware because I've clinically I've done paper charts, used a fixed computer, had a laptop in my lap, and used a, a, a tablet also. And I just wondered if that makes any difference or people look at in and it's looking at that kind of thing to make the patient contact better. Yeah, um. You know, the, I mean, there's there there's a lot of research. Well, I shouldn't say there's a lot. There's some research that has been done. Um, and, and actually, I'm not the foremost expert on it, but everything I read seems to think that the critical thing is to um, it establish the triad, you know, so we're moving from the dyad of the patient and the physician, um, although I can certainly remember from my own years of clinical practice, I'd sit, be sitting there writing in the chart, you know, with the patient sitting across from me, um, but um, m moving to this more kind of triad model where the patient sees what's happening in the computer. I mean, I've seen physicians who kind of keep the screen. They look at the patient, but they're looking at the screen too, and that's probably not the best way to do it. So I don't know about a particular hardware. I imagine the device needs to be big enough, or at least the screen needs to be big enough for the patient to, to see it, um, you know, as opposed to showing your patient your phone or something like that if you're entering data that way. Um, so so I, I, I don't know. I, but I, I think that probably the technology, the, the important thing about the technology is not so much which technology you use, but something that enables you to engage with the patient. Any other? We can go back. Yeah, other. sure. Sorry to no, that's fine. Uh, another huge problem are patient identifiers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, 
Look, every single program has their own line of referencing patients, and, and everybody's afraid to share that information because of privacy and all of this, and it's, it's a problem. Yeah. The lack of a standardized identifier. Yeah, well, um, uh, most, uh, some people know this, the original HIPAA legislation said that we will establish a national health identifier in 1996, and it uh, politically went over like a lead balloon, and um, you know it, it led to um, you know people saying things. Oh, you know the government wants to establish a database, you know, of all healthcare, you know, of all your healthcare, which which was not true. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, not not having a standard identifier um, has been a problem. Some people say we don't need it because we're we're so good at record matching. You know, just look at how. Facebook or Google can connect you to this and that, um, but um, it probably would be made a little easier. Um, it certainly has, um, you know, the potential to be misused. I, I suspect that the benefit would outweigh the risk, and maybe as um, people get more confident in our ability to keep information secure, um, which they're not right now, understandably, um, that, um, you know, maybe they would be more accepting of it. Ma many other countries um, use uh, national identifiers. Uh, Singapore, um, New Zealand, there's actually a great, uh, some, some of you have taken my classes now, there's a great website uh, about the New, New Zealand ident patient identifier. I don't think that's the exact name of it, but they explain the whole rationale and why it's important and, and things like that. So um, we'll see what happens with uh, identifiers. Yeah, Nathan. Um, if you had an opportunity to rewrite regulation, how would you do so to tackle some of the challenges you cited? Yeah, if I had the opportunity. If I could be king for a day. <laughs> um, uh, or if uh, President Obama called me into his office and said, how would you change this? Um, I, I think that in retrospect, there was probably not enough um, emphasis put on interoperability. Um, and I think that um, uh, many of the criteria, um, we, we actually haven't even seen yet the criteria for stage three of meaningful use. There's, they're, they're literally at the printers and the government will be publishing them. Um, there's drafts that have been seen. But e even stage two has been very challenging for healthcare organizations. And it also, the, one of the challenges with the meaningful use criteria is they've they've really um, stifled innovation in other areas because everyone, you know, the vendors, the hospitals, the physicians and others have been so focused on meeting the criteria that they haven't really had any bandwidth to do other kinds of innovative things. And um, uh, uh, for example, I recently was uh, chatting with someone from Kaiser that was doing EHR as well before meaningful use and, and was really, for Kaiser, he claimed that uh, meaningful use was a big, a big waste of time because they were already already doing most of that stuff, but they had to make sure that they did enough of it to get the money. Um, so, um, so anyways, you know, maybe kind of less prescribed um, and and more towards having the functionality that enage, enables um, uh, interoperable systems and. Uh, the ability to participate in uh, quality measurement and improvement programs and things like that would, would probably be a way uh, to do it. I, I don't know that we could have really anticipated that, you know, five, six years ago. You know, it's always easy in hindsight to look back. Um, but clearly, um, I, I don't think we did enough uh, for interoperability. Yeah, Dana. My question relates to momentum. Do you think we've established a new inertia Yeah, so the question is whether um, we have the momentum to keep going or, or we'll hit um, inertia, especially around things like secondary use of data. Um, that's a great question. Um, you know, I didn't predict everything right here, so I don't know that I want to go too far out on a limb. Um, I, I mean, it's clear that, you know, at least the, the money part of meaningful use is ending. Actually, that's not totally true because um, the meaningful use was structured that in the first few years you get the money and the financial incentives beyond that are in the form of penalties if you don't reach meaningful use. And 
I always thought, and I still believe it's going to happen, that at some point, some, you know, the political process will wipe out those penalties. They're, they're actually being reformulated into um, other healthcare quality programs. Some of you may be familiar with this thing called MIPS. Uh, not the MIPS we know from computing, but um, it's something uh, about uh, different payments around quality measures and so forth. Um, so I, um, so there, there might be um, some continued penalty for not meeting meeting meaningful use, but clearly there isn't going to be any more money uh, going into it. Um, so what will happen? I, I think I think that probably the best driver of, of health IT is actually not you know giving people money for meaningful use, but creating a healthcare system that that values um, integration and coordination of information, or really integration and coordination of care. Um, when you move and and, and um, uh, you know, uh, the Secretary of Health and Human Services has said that as we go forward, Medicare um, is going to, um, its remuneration is going to be more related to quality, the so-called value over volume, uh, moving away from fee-for-service towards um, more, um, towards uh, reimbursement that is um, uh, more related to the quality of care you deliver um, when, when you need to do things like prevent readmissions to the hospital and deliver high quality care to a whole population, information becomes important. And that's what should probably be the best driver of, of adoption of, of EHRs and not you know, giving people money because 60% of their orders are now electronic and things like that. So I don't know, it's my thought on that. Anything else? Okay, well, thank you all for coming to our inaugural Grand Rounds, and hopefully you'll come to more.